names and if you can just unmute and let us know you're here. Uh, Vice Chair Siegel. Um, here. Uh, Commissioner Scharf. Here. Commissioner Bowie. Here. Commissioner Metz. Here. Commissioner Johnston. Here. And Commissioner Smith. Present. <clears throat> All right, and I am here as well. So that's as far as we get for now. Um, again, commissioners will leave this Zoom, go to the other Zoom. We will have a closed session in consultation with the city's IT operations manager regarding current cyber threat environment and utility cybersecurity programs by the authority of government code section 54957A. Um, so we will now go into that closed session and return hopefully close to 6.10 p.m. Uh, so let's pick up where we left off. We just finished our closed session. Um, agenda review and revisions. I don't believe we have any revisions to the agenda. Um, so why don't we move on to oral communications, uh, members of the public who want to address the commission on any item not on today's agenda. If anyone from the public would like to speak, please raise your hands. Okay, I see three. Okay, maybe two. Oh, three. Okay, Great. we'll go. I and think uh, I saw a reminder, David we go. usually, we usually oh, allow three minutes okay. for each public commenter. Okay, I saw Mr. Cole's hand go first. So Mr. Cole, please speak. Let me uh, unmute you. Hold on. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, commissioners and staff, for this opportunity to address you this evening. I'd like to speak briefly to the comments that I sent you yesterday evening. Uh, while my comments may have been a little more politic, my training is in electrical engineering, not in writing, so it's a little blunt, perhaps. That said, I hope you have learned something about the equipment and the process for solar installations and permitting. That was my main purpose. I also hope that the next update from staff on this item is more fact-based and straightforward as the permitting process is in need of an overhaul, uh, has been in, in need of an overhaul for a long time now, and business as usual is not an option anymore. Um, I'd also like to hear how the permitting process is going to handle the additional electrification projects needed, not just solar as the city embarks on the decarbonization effort necessary to reach our SCAP goals. So thanks for letting me speak to uh, my comments and that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Cole. you, Mr. Cole. Oh, sorry, Mr. Kelly, um, let me allow you to talk. Okay, um, the floor is yours, Mr. Kelly. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Forsell, Vice Chair Siegel, Commissioners, um, I'd like to talk, actually, I'd like to build a little bit upon what David was saying there uh, a while ago. This relates to a letter that I sent you over a month ago on September 1st, and it concerns how the UAC should, in, in my opinion, be addressing problems having to uh, do with housing and uh, potentially catastrophic global warming here in Palo Alto. Um, as David was saying, I think there's a real problem with the current permitting processes and I'll get to that in a minute, but the purpose of my remarks and the purpose of my letter to you was basically to lay out some principles that I think ought to be uh, guiding your deliberations in the future as we, as we, dig, as we uh, drill down on some of these issues. The basic facts are simple, and I, I don't think anyone's really gonna dispute these. Um, catastrophic global warming is a huge problem, not just for Palo Alto, but for the whole world. Uh, at, we also know that in California, we have enormous problem with housing. Uh, as I mentioned in my letter, the California Air Resources Board has indicated that uh, building more compact neighborhoods is one of the ways to address significant, uh, is one of the ways to create significant climate benefits. And I think infill housing in general and more compact housing uh, uh, in addition are some of the things that Palo Alto has to look at much more carefully in connection with the SCAP process. Uh, I was intrigued by the study that came out of um, the, the study on carbon footprint planning, quantifying local and state mitigation opportunities for 700 California cities, which I cited in my paper. 
uh, there, one of the things I found particularly surprising that is that uh, urban infill may actually represent one of the most important ways for wealthier communities uh, in uh, particularly in the Bay Area to address their climate goals. Since the time I wrote to you, um, SB9 has been enacted. So we can reasonably expect that in addition to additional housing that will, that will result from ADUs, there will probably be even more infill housing created in Palo Alto as a result of SB9. So what does all this have to do with the UAC and its relationship with the uh, city council? Uh, I offer uh, several principles that I think should be applied in dealing with these issues. The first is utilities policies and practices should give homeowners and other property owners greater flexibility because they will generally make reasonable decisions concerning their properties. I don't think this should come as a surprise to anyone. Most of the people who are City of Palo Alto's utilities customers have lived in the community for a long time. In making choices about building housing and providing utilities for new housing, Owners probably have a better idea of what's necessary for themselves, their neighbors, their blocks, their local communities, I think, than the city of uh, Palo Alto Utilities does. So we should be giving owners choices in making these decisions. Uh, perhaps most importantly, I think the city of Palo Alto Utilities should embrace principles of universal service and universal access. What does that mean? It means we shouldn't be having two classes residential customers, some who are you know, first class customers and, and others who are in effect second class customers. We need to have policies that meet the that will meet the needs of people living in new infill housing, including those living in ADUs and new housing that will be created as a result of SB9. I too believe that the city will not be able to meet its current SCAP goals with current utilities policies. The third principle that I really urge you to embrace is saying essentially the capital expenditures for capacity upgrades and line extensions on public thoroughfares should be amortized system wide. I think this is an increasing problem and one that really has to be recognized. Current uh, uh, city of Palo Alto utilities policies as I understand it, create problems and essentially a, a free rider problem when people are trying to electrify. We're discouraging people from engaging in certain forms of electri electrification or providing service to new infill housing by saying that if you're the person who triggers an upgrade cost, whether it's for a line extension or for a new transformer, you're gonna have to pay for that as a uh, individual homeowner. And I just don't think that makes any sense at all. I can't believe that we've had that policy for as long as we've had. Fourthly, uh, I would urge you to adopt policies that will ensure that housing and climate action goals are considered at every level uh, in uh, UAC decision-making. I think these issues are gonna impact staffing, uh, the skills and the training that people are gonna need, the rates. Uh, you should be identifying these problems and opportunity areas now. And there are opportunities here. I think you heard from uh, the chief building official at a prior meeting when he was talking about the solar app plus uh, opportunity. I don't see why we can be doing a lot of other things uh, in terms of permitting, and uh, working with uh, homeowners who are trying to get upgrades for their utility service. And lastly- Mr. Mr. Kelly, uh, just quickly, you're well over time. So if you're, you can sorry. find a way to wind lastly, it Lastly, I would just encourage you to pursue greater transparency uh, with the public and with other uh, members of the city government in pursuing these goals. Sorry to go so long and thank you very much for your attention. I'll try to flush out these principles in the future. All right, thank you very much. Um, as you know, we're not able to comment um, at this time, but we appreciate you uh, coming and speaking. It looks like we might have one more speaker. Is that right? Yes, it looks like we do. Mr. Comey, let me unmute. Here we go. Mr. Comey, you can speak if you unmute your mic. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, as noted, my name is Chuck Comey. Uh, first of all, thank you for to all of you for your service to our community through your work on this committee. And thank you for the time to speak. I, I sent all of you a letter yesterday uh, reporting a situation relating to a power line upgrade that we've been asked to do pursuant to the city's requirement for a home remodeling project that we're in the closing stages of at 4190 Wilmar Drive in the Green Acres neighborhood. This part of Green Acres is uh, underground in terms of power and other utilities. 
to summarize, the city is asking that my wife, Judith and I, as the homeowners, essentially fund the ex excavation of a trench across the public street in front of our house to lay new two to four inch conduit lines to connect standard 200 amp service to the home. As noted in my letter, based on estimates I've received, the costs of this work would run in the range of 20 to $27,000 one might ask, why do we have to dig this trench across the street in the first place? The answer is that unlike all of the houses around us, we don't have a power box or what's called a draw box, as I understand it, actually in our front yard or in the front sidewalk. Rather, due to a decision that the city apparently made many years ago that we were not a party to, our home is the only one that has a line running essentially directly from the fuse box on the side of the home, not to our own power box, but to one located some 30 yards across the street. As noted in my letter, the city uh, utility staff has made clear that we must pay this cost and that they will not reconsider this uh, anomalous and at least in my view, fundamentally unfair outcome. And that to appeal, I should speak with the city council. And so in closing, I just wanted to reach out to you as UAC members, as well as to Mr. Philseth and Mr. Bachelor as liaisons uh, to seek your input and support so that um, the utility staff could promptly reconsider its decision so that we would not have to pay this 20 to $27,000 cost to dig up a public street that we obviously do not own or maintain um, in order to comply with the city's requirement based on this anomalous existing power connection in our case to this box across the street rather than one located on our own property or in the front sidewalk as would be the normal configuration. I, I believe those costs are most reasonably borne by the city and you know could be amortized across the system. Um, I'm reaching out also, as I understand that the UAC has been looking into uh, problems with the permitting process for electrical upgrades in Palo Alto. And so this could be um, yet another example of, of such an issue. Thank you very much uh, for your consideration and attention to this matter. I'd be happy to answer any questions either now or at a future time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Comey. Um, we actually can't ask you any questions uh, at this time, because it's not an agendized item. Um, but I do think we're allowed to say, I, I'm, could you please double check where you sent that email? I myself did not receive it. I don't know about I, other commissioners. I, I sent it to the UAC at City of Palo Alto email that was in the instructions. I can certainly resend it if uh, others also didn't receive it. I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, and then are there any other members of the public wanting to speak? Anybody else from the public would like to speak? There is no more hands raised. All right, then let's move on. Uh, the next item is um, approval of the minutes. Um, are there any uh, comments or potential revisions to the minutes? Um, I actually have one, um, which, which is that the approval of the prior month's minutes was listed as the motion passed 5-0, but there were actually only five commissioners present and uh, Vice Chair Siegel um, abstained from voting. So the motion actually only passed 4-0. And also she's listed as Vice Mayor Siegel, which, <laughs> which is a nice promotion, but probably should just be listed as Vice Chair. Um, so given those revisions, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and move. Um, I normally don't, but I will move that we approve the uh, draft minutes from the September 1st special meeting. I'll second. All right, and I'll do a quick roll call to vote. 
Uh, Vice Chair Siegel. Approve. Uh, Commissioner Bowie. Commissioner Bowie, are you uh, on mute? Yes, uh, approved, sorry. Thank you. Commissioner Johnston. Approve. Commissioner Metz. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Commissioner Scharf. Yes. And who am I missing? Um, one, two, three. Okay, that was all of us and I uh, vote to approve as well. Um, great, so we approve with those revisions, the September minutes. Um, we do not have any unfinished business from last month. So that brings us to the utilities director's report. Director Batchelor. Thank you, Chair Fursell. Evening commissioners. A uh, couple things uh, this month that uh, is notable. First of all, it's uh, Public Power Week. Um, uh, this week we join uh, public utilities across the nation to celebrate um, Power Week, um, which is hosted annually during, usually during the first week of October. Um, as a public power provider, we focus on serving the Palo Altans with cost-effective smart energy programs, local policy involvement, environmental sustainability, and more personal customer service um, that we can um, experience. Um, we'll be raising awareness of many benefits in the public week this week across the communication uh, outreach platforms and uh, to visit us on the utility website to follow its social medias to see some of the messages and helping spread the good word. Also, too, is that it's Energy Efficiency Day today, um, October the 6th. Um, it's more efficiency is one of the fastest, most effective ways to save money, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, creating jobs and meeting grown uh, growth energy demands, while every day is an energy efficiency day. Uh, we're sending out special invitations for the community members to pledge to save energy on the official energy efficiency day, and we're taking um, actions on that. I'm not sure if the public is not sure how to get involved with that, they can contact the Home Efficiency Genie uh, for home uh, consulting, which is at cityofpaloalto.org slash forward efficiency genie. Um, National Drive Week was last week. We celebrated National Drive Electric Week for promoting many EV discounts and rebates um, available for Palo Altans to host an EV Charging 101 webinar partnerships with Acteria. And we presented with uh, Willow Glen Electric has installed over 5,000 EV charger stations throughout the Bay Area, including load shifting smart panels, which can help adjust time of the day and night home energy uses. The class was attended by about 70 folks. Uh, most of them were Palo Alto residents and eager to learn more about EVs and installing EV chargers. <clears throat> For the sixth year in a row, um, we're partnering with um, uh, Bay Area Sunshade, um, a solar and battery storage discount program administered by the Building Council of Climate Change. Residents can register by November the 30th and sign installation contracts by December 31st. CPAU is hosting a free educational workshop on Tuesday, October the 26th from 6.30 to 7.30. And the workshop details, the links and the programs are on cityofpaloalto.org forward slash workshops. Uh, refrigerator recycling is back. A couple months ago, I was talking that uh, uh, it was suspended for a period of time, um, but we were able to work out our contract details. Residents that have old refrigerators and freezers that no longer are needed or are used uh, can take advantage of it and will um, call and contact us. And we will also give them a $50 de um, rebate. And this is just one of the other things that we're helping the community with uh, getting rid of their refrigerators. And the last uh, item basically is gas safety. Um, we're currently mailing out copies of our gas safety awareness brochure to all the customers within the zip codes of Palo Alto, as well as non-customers living near gas um, pipelines, public officials, emergency response, excavators, contractors, locators, and also plumbers that do uh, work in Palo Alto. This is part of the regulatory compliance, public awareness communications for our Federal Department of Transportation, DOT. Within the next month or so, we're gonna engage with a contractor to conduct phone and email surveys and customers to fulfill the regulatory um, obligations. If we're interested in any of the details about the gas safety on um, outreach, 
we can go to cityofpaloalto.org forward slash safety utilities. Uh, just uh, for note, um, some of upcoming events, sustainability and climate action plans uh, meeting is going to be this, uh, apologize, next week, Thursday, the 14th from nine to 1130. And then um, lawn uh, native trees and plants um, is going to um, have a webinar on Wednesday to November the 17th from 6 to 7.30. And with that, that concludes my report, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so then we have our new business. Oh, looks like Commissioner Johnson has a question about the report. Go ahead. Yes. I just had one question, uh, Director Bachelor. We, we, the new power content label went out as an insert to the, to the bills. I just wondered if we'd gotten any reaction to the kind of the change in the label. We have not heard anything from the community. Um, as you can tell, as when you had an opportunity to look at it prior to going out, as well as as you received it, you notice it's a little different. We talked about the reasons why, um, but we have not um, seen any comments coming from the public or from the community. Okay, good. All right. Um, yeah, that is interesting. The um, the next item then is our discussion of the fiber backbone and Palo fiber broadband expansion. Um, are there any members of the community that want to speak on this topic? Does anyone from the public want to speak on this item? If so, please raise your hand. No hands are raised. Chair for self. All right. Then uh, I assume there's a, is there a staff presentation on this? There is chair for sale. So um, tonight we uh, thought that uh, it would, we would bring back some updates on what we've been doing with the fiber backbone. We have our consultant um, uh, Magellan with us, um, Jory Wolf and uh, John Honker who um, have been um, our consultants and working with us on this and we also have some staff members that will um, be giving some of the presentation as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John. Great, thank you, Dean Bachelor, and good evening, Chair Purcell and Commissioners. Uh, good to be back in front of you again. It's been a few months. And uh, what we wanted to do is really kind of provide an informational update on the fiber project uh, since we last saw you, which I believe was April of last, of earlier in the year. Um, so a significant amount of progress has been made since that time, and uh, we're on track uh, in really all the phases of the project, which is exciting. Uh, this is a, a significant undertaking for, for you, for the community, and also for, uh, for the entire uh, Palo Alto team. So um, I wanted to first really bring you back up to speed. Since it's been a little bit of time, just a quick refresher on what's happening with the fiber project currently. So uh, as you remember, we had consolidated a couple of phase of the a couple of the phases in the fiber project to really accelerate the timeline uh, to get to a combined fiber to the home broadband and a fiber backbone design. Um, what we've been able to do is pull together really uh, the, the first piece of this, which is the community engagement, as well as the broadband surveys that will be going out in sort of the November timeframe for uh, residents and businesses. And in parallel, what we're working on on the technical and the engineering side is uh, phase two, which is the detailed backbone engineering design. Uh, as well as the aerial and underground design, construction standards, and the final packages. This phase two really gets you to a point where you can put the construction, uh, I'm sorry, put the engineering design out for bid to construction contractors and begin building the fiber backbone. Concurrent to that, we're also working through phase four, which is the fiber to the home design. And we have a lot of synergy between phases two and four because uh, the backbone and fiber to the home both uh, interconnect with one another, both uh, you know, interoperate with one another, and uh, it gives us efficiencies of being able to do both designs simultaneously and get those completed for you well ahead of uh, the timeframe that would be to do them separately. 
So the phase four design is really focused on your fiber to the home right? or fiber to the premise, as we call it. Uh, the uh, uh, broadband engineering design to pass to reach 100% of homes and businesses across Palo Alto. Um, it will focus really on the best way to deploy and at the least cost to deploy both aerial and underground fiber utilizing your existing uh, telephone uh, or utility poles and your uh, existing right of way that's out there. Uh, they will also be coupled with uh, construction standards for fiber to the home that are based on the city's existing civil standards, as well as more specific standards for fiber construction uh, itself and, uh, and equipment specifications and other things that are associated with the, uh, fi the final fiber to the home uh, build. You'll also have with that a full set of construction prints and packages that like the backbone, you'll be able to go out and immediately uh, put this out to bid uh, for construction if it's the uh, council's decision or the commission's decision to do so. Um, along with that, there's some other planning tasks that we're working on for you, which include the broadband business plan, uh, which is going to be kicking off this month as well as an assessment of the potential grant opportunities that are out there that may be able to fund certain components of the fiber optic network, as well as really a, a regulatory risks analysis of what Palo Alto as a, as a city and a municipal utility needs to be aware of as you're moving closer to fiber to the home. So building the awareness around those regulatory issues uh, of, of potentially providing service, uh, internet service, uh, it will, be, will be coming in the next uh, 45 to 60 days. Um, so this really provides a snapshot of, of where, uh, what you know, the activities that are happening in the project uh, today. As we um, talk about them in a little bit more detail, you know, one of the key uh, and most important aspects of the fiber to the home uh, campaign is really to develop the community engagement around that and, and help bring the community along to understand where Palo Alto is today, solicit feedback, understand demand, um, and communicate and educate the uh, community about fiber to the home. You've done this already in the past, but now we're at a new stage and, it, and, and, it, and we're in a new era, right, of needs for uh, broadband internet. And uh, this engagement campaign is really focused on really uh, bringing, uh, bringing that information to your residents and, uh, and then hearing back from them what they want to say, what they have to say. And it's really a, a couple of different uh, tools here. One is the, the fiber website has been established and we'll link over to those in just a minute, but I wanna just go through these quickly. Um, the, the FAQ and the content's been completed for the website and really all the front facing uh, Palo Alto pages. Um, an engagement portal has been established, which uh, Megan and Amanda from communications are going to uh, uh, go through with you. Um, the residential and business surveys have been developed and are actually ready for a launch. So, you know, in addition to just the engagement activities, we also want to look at the quantitative demand in, in, in Palo Alto for internet services, which will help you gain intelligence on pricing, on packages, on speeds, on things that people really want and what's really important to Palo Alto citizens and businesses in their internet services. So, so think of this as really true the market analytics behind um, the engagement and behind what the community, uh, how the community feels about broadband. Um, finally, branding has been complete. You can see the new Palo Alto Fiber logo up here, and uh, there's a whole uh, set of brand uh, guidelines that have been developed with that. Um, community engagement next steps are really to, one, launch the residential and business surveys. As I mentioned before, we're looking at sort of the November, December timeline line to have those surveys out to your citizens and your businesses. Uh, separate surveys for both, right, or for each group, because the broadband needs and the markets are very different. Uh, as we go through that launch and, and collection of those surveys and responses, 
we'll be providing you guys you the results back in January. So those those are very there's a quick turn on these surveys generally because we'll be using email distribution for them. That gives us an opportunity to very quickly get the results back of that and then uh, come back at a later date to report those results. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Megan and Amanda from Communications, who are going to walk you really through the portal and, and some of the, uh, the branding uh, that's been created for Palo Alto Fiber. Good evening. Thank you, John. I appreciate being here this evening. Megan Horgan Taylor. Um, wanted to introduce first the other members of our team that will help walk us through our new digital platform. Um, wanted to make sure to introduce, of course, Darren Nemoto, our IT director, um, and a member of his team who's critical to this project, Jay Savarha, um, and also a member of my team, Amanda De Jesus. Um, they will all help this evening to help walk you through a preliminary look at our um, digital platform that we're launching very soon. Um, it's a pretty exciting collaboration between our office and the IT um, department, as well as the utility department and um, John's team as well. So we appreciate all the work there. Uh, a lot of uh, content developed um, that you'll see as part of this effort. Um, and we're really excited that um, we're piloting um, this new platform with the fiber initiative. Um, and closely thereafter, another um, topic that I know is of interest to the commission is sustainability and climate action. Um, and that is actually the next initiative that will be launched through this platform. So we may be back with you at another point to uh, walk through that secondary um, uh, content uh, with you at, at another time. Um, so what I, we wanted to do tonight is just walk through the platform itself. Um, but I, before we do that, I did just want to take a moment to talk about the goal. The goal of this overall platform is both to inform the community about different major initiatives that the city is working on um, and also help to engage around these major initiatives. Um, obviously, fiber is, has been and is a major initiative for our community. And we're excited that um, and hope that this platform helps to bring the community together um, in an exciting different way than before. Um, and so tonight you'll have a preliminary look at um, what we'll be launching soon. Um, as part of that effort, we will be launching a robust communications um, plan as part of the process as well. Uh, and some of the tools to hopefully um, engage the community and have them engage with each other um, through being ambassadors for fiber um, you'll see some of those tools as well um, as part of the platform tonight. Um, so I think I covered most of the items that I wanted to cover. So I think at this point, I'll hand it off to Darren to say a few words, and then we'll um, get into showing you the platform itself. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Just briefly wanted to give an overview. So we are leveraging a platform uh, that we have been building over the past few years, and it's built on the ESRI platform, um, which is a market leader in the GIS space. And, you know, the great thing with this is it's included with our licensing. So the only cost is really development efforts to develop the um, content and the um, some of the back end um, features, but again, we're just leveraging an existing platform to be able to deliver the service. And I will introduce Jay to walk through some of the uh, other details on it as well. So Jay, off to you. Thank you, Darren. And while Jay pulls up his uh, screen to show you the platform, um, I did just want to mention, you'll see as part of the, um, as we walk you through it, we do have um, some uh, new branding opportunities as part of this effort. Um, you'll see that we have a fiber logo um, and some uh, fiber branding colors as part of that. Um, and that is an opportunity as well to help us communicate about this overall initiative. So thank you, Jay. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Megan. Uh, before I dive in and show you guys the Fiber Hub, I just want to take a minute and just give an overview of the technology and the platform we have been using to build this Fiber Hub as part of the city's GIS modernization efforts, as Darren mentioned a few years ago, which started a few years ago, we started leveraging 
and transitioning into from our legacy GIS system into S3's ArcGIS platform. It is S3's ArcGIS platform is the leading mapping and analysis solution, and it's also a, it's been estimated that a big portion of the GIS systems used in federal, state, local government is running on S3 ArcGIS platform, and they are also a dominant player in uh, utilities, electric, gas, water, uh, telecom, and also other uh, other departments like uh, pu public works and public safety. They're a big player in those two. So this specific solution we used uh, S3's platform called ArcGIS Online plus another component called Hub. With Hub, what it does is it gives you an ability to configure community engagement platform like what you're going to see right now, and this also helps engage and collaborate with the community easily. And uh, here is the hub we set up for the fiber initiative. Amanda, do you want to walk through the different? Sure. Um, yeah, so this hub is a great communication and engagement tactic, really. This first page is just an overview. The whole point of this, as Megan and others have stated already, is a way to help inform and engage with the community on fiber and eventually other topics like sustainability and climate action. So this first page is just an overview about what Palo Alto Fiber is, what it entails, what the project is. If you want to scroll down a little bit, you can see pretty basic, good information. Um, moving on to the benefits, it provides a high level introduction about the benefits to having fiber in Palo Alto, specifically to residences, residents and businesses. Um, we'll skip over the get involved tab for now. The resources, this page in particular is where we identify various resources that will be useful to the community. For example, our FAQs that we've developed. And then on the right there is a fact sheet that's downloadable. And as we create more, um, more elements, more infographics, fact sheets, other things that come up as the project progresses, we will be including them on this resources page. Eventually our idea is to have a type of page maybe on this one, maybe an entirely new tab that connects the community to different social, essentially calling it social connections, being able to connect the community to, to different stakeholders related to fiber and then on other pages related to the topic. Contact us is a very basic, just provides information for people to connect with the city specifically through the fiber email and back to the city's home, home site. One thing too, I think that was glossed over is the, on the resources page, we also connect back to the city's website with that, which we created a dedicated project webpage. I think it's on here, um, a dedicated project webpage that's consistent with the rest of our city project websites or web pages. excuse me. Um, clearly that needs to be updated. <laughs> Um, so then moving over to the Get Involved tab, Jay, do you want to talk a little bit about the mapping feature or do you want me to go ahead with the engagement feature? I can talk about the mapping. Great. Thank you. And uh, so part of the GIS tool we use, so this, this is the biggest advantage we get, uh, mapping related functionality we can easily leverage. And so here uh, you can, anyone in the community can put in these entry fields. We are collecting uh, these are the fields we are collecting, first name, last name. Are you a resident or a business? How would you use fiber at home, your current service provider? Any other thoughts, a preformed text box where you can put in whatever neighborhood you belong to. And so you have two ways to mark in where you live, uh, you can either drop a pointer wherever you live, or you can also type in an address. If you type in an address partially, it'll fill it out. Like you could see right now in this small section here, I would just point, uh, drop a pointer. And once we do drop a pointer and you can say report it, and that data gets recorded in the cloud system. and uh, for privacy reasons, we don't show the precise location. We put a 50 meter buffer 
and that's the location we show. And all entered records, we have lots of test records here. We would clean it up before we go live. And once an existing collected record is clicked, these are the attributes we display. The first name, how do you use fiber and the neighborhood. So this feature we wanted to implement to allow an extra level of engagement on the, for the community, really just to show support, learn about what other people think about Palo Alto Fiber, and really have a way where people can interact with each other through this platform. Eventually, of course, as you can tell that this website is still in the, in the process of being finalized and fine-tuned, and we have some really great ideas to help facilitate more engagement through this site and in a way that may be something to where we people can interact with each other and talk to each other, whether it's a like button or something like that. We're talking about having a, a little bit more of an in-depth engagement aspect on this page um, versus just being able to see what people are saying about Palo Alto Fiber. We're in the process of completing our communications plan. Um, and in that we were, we're planning on developing a video series to complement the launch of the, of this hub site, a social media campaign and other fun ways that the community can engage on this topic. Um, right now, I mean, we're right now and we will continue to seek excited community member, com community members who are ambassadors who want to become further involved. And, and this is one way that we envision being able to identify people who are excited about Palo Alto Fiber. By being able to sign up through here, providing your email address, we can send notifications, updates, what have you as this project progresses. Um, I think that's a little bit about the engagement piece that I have. So back to Megan. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, oh, Jay. Oops, sorry, ahead, Amanda. The one last thing I wanted to say is that, like I was saying, the Palo Alto Fiber web webpage is live right now on the city's website. It's just cityofpaloalto.org slash Palo Alto Fiber. So this hub will be integrated onto that, not integrated, it will be on that website. So you can go back and forth once this hub is live, you'll be able to go back and forth between the two. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask you to share the direct link to the um, project page. So thanks for that. And yep. thank you both for all of your work. We appreciate um, getting to this point. We're pretty excited to share this with the commission and also to gain input um, and feedback on this new tool and other thoughts you might have. So I think, um, John, I'm not sure if um, we can take questions at this point or do you have some other slides that you wanted to present um, first? Um, I, no, I, I think that's fine, Megan. That would be great. I mean, it, it's a, a, why don't we take some questions now and then I'll continue with the slides. Perfect. Yeah, I just want to clarify one thing just um, with this demo site, we don't have it publicly available. So you have to have a user ID and password to get into it. And once we launch it, then we will make it anonymous access. So, but at this point, it's not a publicly available. So, but it will be soon. And that's, we're very excited about that. So, thank you. All right, um, Commissioner Johnston and then Commissioner Smith. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's, it's really good to see that we're making progress on, on this project, which we all have been talking about for a long time and, and are excited about. One of the things we spent a lot of time talking about back in April when you were last with us was kind of the importance of educating the community before we really did the community survey so that we would get kind of meaningful results from the survey. So my question really is, it, it, how are you gonna put out information about this project other than the, the, the web page that you just showed us? Are there other means by which you're gonna put information out? Um, yes, I could start that conversation and then Amanda, if um, you'd like to also add some additional information, that would be great. Um, so yes, we are working on a robust communications plan to share information about the project. Um, this, this portal is one way 
um, and it is also a, a pretty major means to share the benefits of the project, really help inform um, the project um, and all the different attributes of, the, of fiber um, to the community at an initial stage and initial point of now. Um, as part of that, we will be doing a social media campaign. Um, so we'll be sharing information, of course, through social media, uh, through our website. The project page has other details and information, which I think will be helpful and valuable to the community, including a project timeline and project costs and a, a number of things that I know this commission has been very involved with helping to set and define. Um, in addition, we are uh, creating some video series as part of this effort to help inform and engage the community. Um, and we're also looking for ambassadors as part of this process to host small group meetings to talk about fiber together as a team and um, print the different materials. And that is one reason why we've made them printable um, and share those with their community networks as well. So part of the opportunity is to um, provide the information and then hope that the community also, um, it stimulates conversation between the community members themselves as well. Yeah, no, one, well, two pieces that I would add to that is we're going to be sharing this information throughout our regular communications channels, newsletters, what have you, um, as well as connecting with local organizations like the Fiber League to help promote this work. And of course, you all, <laughs> if you could help out too, the more people that is sharing this information, the more people that we're actually going to reach. So I'm, I'm glad that you're thinking broadly about this because I think uh, it is gonna be important to, to find multiple ways to kind of let the community know that, that they, they need to be paying attention to this. Um, am I correct in thinking that the, the way you're going to survey the community is really through the website? Um, well, John can speak directly to the actual survey tool itself. It's, it will be, we will be sharing it through the website, but also through our community, all of our channels. Um, but John's really helping us to, with a, the platform of how the community will take the survey. Sure, yeah, thanks Megan. And, and uh, Commissioner Johnson, really what we're, what we're looking at is kind of two, two approaches. One, as Megan said, using the sort of the engagement and the tools that have been developed by, by the Palo Alto team to sort of push that out and uh, get some direct engagement uh, from the community. We also want to survey in sort of a more uh, quantitative and a, a more sort of a technical approach That'll give us good information on, you know, market and market data, uh, demand data, pricing. You know, ask all the questions, the more detailed questions that'll really help shape the demand picture for Palo Alto, and we'll do that in a way that's very statistically significant and relevant by, you know, uh, doing more email-based distribution and random samples across the, across the community. So we see it really as two tiers, one to really get the, some more of the anecdotal and the engagement information directly from the community, but then get that uh, quantitative data on the back end that we really need to, to help shape the, the business side of uh, broadband for Palo Alto. And just to know um, something that I remembered uh, in discussions with John is part of the survey will also be a tool to inform. Uh, and so we'll have links to these different online resources for the community that may not have heard about the project yet, but want to get more information before they take the survey. Um, so it'll also be an opportunity for us to share more information as well. So I'm, I'm um, comforted by the fact you, you, you've obviously thought about this deeply and I, I appreciate that. Um, my last concern really has to do with the timeline. It sounds like you're, you're looking to get responses back from the survey in the November, December timeframe. And I'm just wondering if that's, if that, if that's too short a time frame, time frame to both get the information out, get the level of engagement that, uh, that you want. And I think that is important. Uh, and then get responses back that are really going to be kind of comprehensive and meaningful. John, do you want me to? 
Um, sh sure. I, uh, I, you know, we, we've discussed that quite a bit and, you, you know, because of the holidays, you know, it's, it's we have a good window between, you know, Chris, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. There's a couple of weeks there where the quantitative work can get done, right? Because that piece of it, the actual sort of the scientific survey that goes out, well, usually we get the, our results within a week. Um, I think the question becomes, is there enough runway in the front end of that just to get the education completed? Um, we think there is because that, that process has already started, um, but we'll, we'll continue to track it. If we see if, if we need to push things forward a bit, it's always an option because um, there are other tasks in the in this phase of the project that can still be that, that are still not going to be done till sort of the March timeframe. So, you know, I, I think that there's an opportunity to push it if we really felt like it, it needed to be. Yeah, I want to just echo that there. I think there is some flexibility with the time frame. Uh, we did take a look at the overall timeline and try to use some of our best practices of some of the other campaigns that we've uh, launched uh, and looked at some of the timeframes of those. Um, and really, it seems like the six to eight week time frame is a good one in terms of informing the community, especially with what we're planning. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do think that that does provide us with a good window of time to do that informing and engagement, engaging in advance of the survey being launched. Because obviously um, it's, it's not only, I mean, this, the survey will build, hopefully build support for this project as well as gather information. And I think that uh, one of the things that I think we're concerned about is to make sure that there's an adequate kind of take rate from the community to make this uh, project really work. So I, I appreciate the fact that um, yeah, you're, you're going to be looking at making sure you've got um, thorough engagement and response here before moving forward. So thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Smith. I, thank you. Um, I think Commissioner Johnson and I were reading from the same playbook and, and quite frankly, his concerns are, are, are mine. Um, but before I get to concerns, I want to say, first of all, kudos, because I think the website is fantastic. Um, and it really does. I love the logo. I love the branding. I love the fact that we're trying to get out there on, the, on a front foot. And I think that's fantastic. But hearkening back to our conversation in April, and this was, a, we spent a couple, of, a couple of meetings going in depth on what the requirements would be for making this happen. Um, and we had extensive discussions about our need to not only inform, but to educate. Um, and the reason is, is because we are literally talking about black box stuff. And most of us know broadband from, we turn on our computer and we better be connecting very, very quickly. That's about what we know. We know we have to pay AT&T or we know we have to pay Xfinity, but it better be fast. And that's what we know. And one of the things that I think we are, we need to pay particular attention to is drawing a distinction between inform and educate. And they can't necessarily be one and the same, nor can they be necessarily simultaneous efforts. They can be, but it's better if you inform, in my view, it's better if you inform and offer an alternative to educate. Um, there are a couple of concerns that I have with respect to a survey tool that asks you for your opinion about broadband and all this detailed information about your own broadband bill and experience. But at the same time, I'm going to offer you a little bit of education on what broadband is. It, it's slighted, if you will. It would, from my view, it'd be better to have education first mm -hmm. and then go forward with the survey. I think also, as I look back upon our notes from April, one of the things that we, as a commission, really, quite frankly, it, we were quite direct in our language, and that was the education would take place before the survey. Um, and I think that's, I think that was done purposely. And in fact, if, as I look back through my own memory, that that is my impression. Um, I too am concerned about the timeline, as as uh, Commissioner Johnson had highlighted. Um, Yes, it's true that many of us will be available, if you will, during the Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday, even into the new year, um, simply by the fact that we'll probably be taking some time off for the holiday. But 
you have to count on the fact that many of us take time off during those periods, quite frankly, to be with family, not necessarily to be online when we've had to be online for the last two years. Um, so I, I would encourage us to reinvestigate not only our sequencing of events, but the timing associated. I think there is still time for you to extend your results to the end of Jan with a February and still meet your March deadlines. Um, from a platform idea, it, it's great. Um, I've seen similar platforms um, via other alternatives. I think it's fabulous. It's, it's very interactive. I get to see within my own community of Palo Verde who would be interested, even if it is a 50, 50 meter um, uh, bubble, which I think is from a security and a privacy perspective is also fantastic and a great way of working and going forward. Um, I think my last commentary, I would like to see a little more um, detail with respect to when we are launching. What are we looking for in terms of ambassadors? How are we getting those ambassadors up to speed? And how, quite frankly, are we qualifying ambassadors? Are we educating our ambassadors? Are we putting together a program for our ambassadors or are simply they're just going to the website, downloading the website and holding a coffee chat, which is perfectly fine. It's certainly a, definitely a way, but the hope is, is that an ambassadors would be truly ambassadors to build to AC Johnson's uh, earlier comment to build this take rate. This is an extremely, um, well, this is a huge investment for the city of Palo Alto. And it's going to shape the city of Palo Alto, not for the next 10 years, for the next 20, 30 years. So we need to take the time necessary to do things exactly right. Um, and that's my comment. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Um, was there any response? Um, sure, I can talk a little bit about the um, items that he listed with just some detail. Um, of course, we're wanting to have this conversation first before we actually launch the platform. So um, it's pretty much uh, ready to go. So very soon within the week, it will be launched. Um, so just giving you a time frame related to that. Um, in, a, in addition, um, your questions around the ambassadors and kind of what tools will they be provided. Uh, we are working on a toolkit as part of that um, process to provide them with tools so that they have um, an idea of how to, how to launch a meeting um, with what type of tools they could use to help communicate and educate the members that they're um, inviting in to have conversations. Um, so that is part of our opportunity and part of the next steps, um, which will be launched as part of the website as well. Um, the fact sheet, of course, is the kind of first piece of collateral that we have. Um, it is a good starting point to educate. Um, it provides benefits, it provides information, it provides uh, tools. And the project page also has very detailed information about just overall time frame, what it means, what the project is. Um, so there, it's a lot of detail is available there as well. So we're pretty excited about that. It's a new new web pages. Um, they didn't exist before. Um, so it also will be collateral and pieces that the community can absorb and use as part of the effort. So I don't know if I answered all your questions there. Um, we I can definitely and would like to we'll meet with you offline and discuss other ideas that you might have to build on that toolkit. Um, so we can definitely do that as well as a next step. Terrific, thank you. So did I understand correctly, there's, there's more presentation, right? Uh, yes, Commissioner Fursa, I've got a couple more slides just on the update for the engineering design yeah. and, uh, and we should be through. Yeah, why don't we go to that and then we'll see if there are additional questions at, at the end. Perfect. Share my screen again. Okay, switching topics over to the engineering design. We just wanted to provide you a you know a high level update on where we are as far as the backbone and the fiber to the home engineering. Um, you know, our goal again is to have this completed by March of 2022, if not sooner. The backbone uh, for fiber to the home, the backbone we're expecting to have completed by the end of the year. Um, John, sorry right? to interrupt. We're not seeing the presentation. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Let me try to share that again. Can, uh, is everyone seeing my screen now? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. How about now? Still no. Okay. I can try to share the presentation that we attach, John, if you want. That'd be, that'd be great, Dave, if you could. Okay. I'm going to try this one more time, but in the interest of everyone's time, that would be great. Still no. Okay, let me try then. Oops. We'll be on slide four, Dave. Okay. Is there, I can try to minimize some of this. Okay. Okay. Let me start again quickly, just to refresh. Um, so, as far as uh, the engineering design work that's being done on both the backbone and the fiber to the home, uh, we're, we have basically completed the end, uh, the thirty percent design on uh, on on both uh, fiber to the home and on the backbone, which is a pretty important step because we did, we actually met the deadline about thirty days uh, ahead of schedule which puts us in a better position to move into the next stage of design, which is really what we call a constructability, uh, constructability fielding, where Magellan's field engineers will be in, on, in market in, within Palo Alto, uh, really surveying all of the areas where fiber will be installed, both on the pole lines and underground. And the goal of that phase is really to make sure that as the design is being developed, we know exactly what the construction environment is going to look like uh, down to the street level, down to literally the flower pot level uh, throughout the community and to every pole in Palo Alto as well. So this is going to, as, as you develop this design, it's going to give you a very, very detailed understanding of both construction costs and actually how construction will be carried out in the aerial environment and in the underground environment. Um, so as we're going through this process, you'll see uh, we, we basically uh, provided uh, uh, signage. Uh, we've been working with the utility to uh, uh, bring our fielders in market, uh, give them the right signage, give them the right policies and procedures. Uh, as they're walking these routes throughout Palo Alto, they'll be wearing hard hats and Magellan vests. Uh, we have uh, magnets with city of Palo Alto contractor on them on our uh, fielders vehicles. And uh, they will be in market for a, a good four to five months uh, for the entire project. So you'll, you'll probably come across them uh, in, in just your daily goings in Palo Alto. Um, they are basically, they, they're very discreet though. They kind of stay out of the way as much as they can. They wanna be uh, you know, invisible as, as, as wherever possible. Um, so that fielding will really give us all of the data that we need to actually get to the final design, which will be Toward the uh, toward the uh, beginning of the uh, the end of the year for the fiber backbone, and in the first quarter for fiber to the home, um, there are a couple of important aspects that we do want to discuss tonight around um, placement of uh, facilities for specifically for fiber to the home. Dave, if we can go to the next slide. So. Okay, yeah. Great, 
Thank you. So, so we really have in, in the community, we have what we call fiber huts and we have fiber cabinets. Uh, the fiber huts, you'll also hear them termed points of presence. These are uh, prefabricated buildings that are specifically designed for telecom and specifically designed for fiber to the home. Um, everything comes back into them, just like your substations, you know, aggregate customer meters across your electric plant. The POPs are a fiber equivalent to distribution substations. Uh, they bring all of the customers across the market into one area where they're aggregated and then their connections are basically uh, routed out to the internet from those locations. These are really um, can be strategically located in Palo Alto. And we've identified five, four or five locations that are optimal. We've been working with the CPAU team to, to determine it, you know, what the best locations are, but we realize that it also needs to be a process that, that goes through you know, Palo Alto's permitting and uh, uh, you know, just the governance process to, to identify the locations. Uh, because they're relatively large. These are you know, 10 by 20 si foot uh, by eight foot uh, tall size structures. And uh, most of our municipal clients that we work with either try to conceal them in a, um, you know, in a substation area, in an unused part of a park that, that can be fenced and can be, uh, can be uh, uh, covered with landscaping or even integrate them inside of an existing facility. So we're looking basically on, based on the size of Palo Alto, we're looking at two to three of these huts being strategically placed throughout the community. And we'll show you some of these uh, locations in a moment. The other aspect is, are the fiber cabinets. Now the fiber cabinets are, are considerably smaller. Um, they're about, you know, two, three feet by four feet by two feet uh, in, in, in volume. And uh, they will be placed throughout the community. You have some of them today out in the market today that connect your existing uh, fiber network. Um, but we're looking at you know, about 130 locations where these cabinets would be placed. And we also have options for the cabinets. We can place, we can place them on the ground, right on a pad uh, mounted uh, uh, foundation. We can actually also conceal them underground inside of vaults so that it's not dis disruptive to sight lines and neighborhoods. The goal would be to try to work through these locations with uh, the Palo Alto team to identify the least disruptive places where they can be located uh, and then use the technology to conceal them wherever possible. You know, the goal would be to try to uh, go underground with some of these cabinets, but we realize that some of them will, will likely have to be above ground. Um, just to give you some visuals of this, Dave, we could skip to slide nine, actually. So really, this is what the, the huts and the cabinets look like. So in, in your top left corner, the fiber hut exterior, typically what you would see at the bottom of a cell phone tower. So your fiber hut is you know, approximately 10 feet wide by uh, 15 to 20 feet long and generally needs to be fenced but then can be landscaped and you know, rel concealed relatively well uh, behind landscaping. Um, it does need generally a generator and HVAC uh, systems, which, which are, you'll see on the front of the, of the hut. Um, so we're looking at uh, locations for two to three of these throughout the Palo Alto community. And we can look, you know, we can really squeeze it in. We can probably shoot for two. Um, inside of each of the huts, you'll basically, you know, they don't look like much from these pictures, but all of the electronics for fiber to the home basically sit in the huts. Uh, and those are going to be accessed typically by telecom technicians, fiber contractors, potentially city, city staff. Um, they're secure facilities. Generally, they'll be fenced and they'll have, um, uh, you know, security systems both on the doors and uh, on the inside for motion sensors. Um, so this really covers those huts. Then the underground, or I'm sorry, the cabinets, you'll see here in the two pictures below. This is on the right, a typical above ground cabinet. So, you know, proportions of this are about four feet tall by about a foot and a half wide by about three feet uh, long. Um, generally sits in a concealed area. Again, they're normally going to be landscaped. Um, 
It, alternatively, because this is generally the best access platform, it's easiest for uh, technicians to be uh, working in for fiber to the home. But you know, one of the newer technologies is to actually bury these ca these cabinets. So what you see on your left hand side is a, in a one of the same cabinets and enclosures, but it's actually mounted in an underground vault. And you know, again, in those sensitive areas, which are going to be probably more than less, we can look at using these underground cabinets to conceal, you know, anything that's uh, you know visibly sensitive to uh, to the community. So we'll be going through a process of locating those. Um, what we've done to date is really uh, identified some locations. This is a, a schematic from one of our customers up in Hillsboro, Oregon, um, that is actually utilizing some parkland and built a hut on, on the corner of that park, but completely concealed by tree cover uh, and, uh, and, and shrubs in front of it. Um, Generally, these are um, uh, can pretty well easily be concealed, but again, we want to really take note of any you know sensitive areas in Palo Alto. Um, so, Dave, if you want to go to the next slide, we've got a couple of locations we can quickly go through. Um, the goal would be. Uh, bef maybe before we do that, let's just let's just talk through this slide. You know, as we look at the hub and cabinet locations, we'll, our goal is really to try to narrow those down to the best locations by really the end of 2021. That doesn't mean necessarily that all the permitting and all of the um, governance to get that passed through as an actual location has to be done, but it allows us to really finish the fiber to the home design because those huts really become important, just like in your electric network, your substations, you know, tie in multiple feeders and multiple distribution cables, your huts do the same thing. So our goal is to kind of work with uh, CPAU and, um, you know, bring these to leadership so that some, uh, some decisions, at least some preliminary decisions or preferences could be made around the hut locations um, and then determine what steps would need to be taken uh, to, to move those forward through the, the governance process, which may take open space approval, um, you know, planning review uh, or architectural review board, the, just the engineering review, maybe public works permitting, you know, anything that the city needs to really be focusing on to, to move a location or to finalize a location. So again, we don't necessarily need to be through all that process uh, by the end of 21. We just need to have a good level of confidence that that's where those huts will be, will be placed. Um, if we want to scroll down to the next page, we can kind of go through some of these locations. So the first one is really that Colorado substation, which is at Colorado and Bayshore. Uh, this is a these these can be good locations because again you know it's substation property um, access is good there's available space you can see the red outline of that hut where it would be um, on the substation property so this is one uh, one of five choices that we have we also have the animal shelter at 3281 East Bay Shore. Um, a lot of different potential opportunities here. We located it here on the corner over by the, the by the main, it looks like the maintenance yard. Um, but it could, you know, it could, we didn't want to take it out into open space here because I know there's some restrictions on that, but somewhere within that property on the, on the existing uh, pavement could work. Next location is fire station five. So fire station five has some available property uh, sort of an, on this corner here um, that could be utilized for the hut. Uh, again, good convenient location and, uh, and, and uh, there's, an, there's ample space in that location for it. Um, next, uh, Ryan brought this one to us, the, the water facility at uh, 1955 Old Page Mill Road um, where the city has some existing property. Uh, and then finally, the Hale Well at 9, 998 Palo Alto Avenue. Um, so, so each of these locations, you know, our goal is to try to find geographically 
uh, or net, let's say network friendly locations for placing a hut. Uh, we also have, instead of you know looking at new construction of with these huts or these prefabs, we also have, Dave, if you want to scroll down to the last page, um, City Hall, right? So we could look at integrating one of the huts inside City Hall uh, with some retrofit and some remediation work to make sure the environment is, uh, you know, acceptable for all the electronics and uh, that it, that's another alternative. Uh, we like that alternative, of course, because, you know, no new huts in the community, right? No, no community impact. You've got an existing facility, but we just need to work on sort of the retrofit plan to make sure that, that hut can function like uh, a, a standalone hut would. Um, so these are like five or six of the best locations that we've found. Again, they're in terms of where they are in the network, they, they work well for, um, for the fiber network for placement and placement's important because as we have all those fiber lines coming back into the hut, linear miles of fiber all increases, right? So where we place those huts becomes very important to minimize the amount of construction we have to do and the amount of fiber that comes into them because we want to keep those linear assets as, as, as short as possible. Um, so this is really where we're at in terms of the huts uh, or potential hut locations. No decisions to be made tonight. This is informational to get you all thinking about it, but uh, those are the really the six locations we've identified as being uh, most optimal for the project. Um, Dave, was there anything you, you would like to add around the, the huts or, um, or discussion? Mm, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to my buttons here. Yeah, I think as John had mentioned, we do um, have to go through the planning and architectural review for the visual impacts of the huts. And then for the construction of the huts, we will have to go through the building department review process. We'll have to look for fire, there's urban forestry, forestry, utilities, conflicting utilities, also public works will be involved and traffic um, control plans and whatnot. So there is a lots of reviews will be required, but like John said, we are just bringing it up to you for consideration tonight, just to see if any sound feasible or there's other opportunities elsewhere that you can think of and propose and we'd be happy to explore. All right, well, thank you. Uh, looks like Commissioner Smith has additional questions. Super, thank you, John. Um, great presentation. I, I really just have one question. What determines the number of huts? Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, finish your question, Commissioner. Sorry. Well, well, I was just getting thrown by the number. If each pop serves 10 to 15,000 customers and we have 27,000 residences plus 4,000 4, businesses, we're at either two or three. I think that's the way the math works, but the locations that you've chosen don't necessarily match with all of those customers. Right, so, so as we look at it, we'll have to make some decisions on, you know, which huts we wanna use in those areas. So, you know, out of the, out of the different huts, we don't want to locate two huts right next to each other, right? We want to, we want to sort of geographically disperse them, but we can keep within the ones that we've shown, we could select potentially three locations out of there and still serve the entire customer base. So the goal would be to really kind of refine the numbers down and determine which ones are the best. And then from a network plan, we can go back and, and basically uh, do all the engineering to determine how that how that serving area would look right if and and then if there are any issues with that we can actually move some to another hut right because it gives us in the feeders just like in your electric system we can we can move a feeder from one hut to the another hut relatively easily and that gives us flexibility to say okay well if we need to re-dimension huts or or rebalance huts we can do that in the network design um, within each of these options Great. And also, I think if we were to reduce the number of huts from three to two, we may need more of those fiber cabinets or larger size of them to serve the same number of customers. That's the alternative. That's, that's correct. Yeah. That's yeah so, so just point of clarification, and I think it was in your slide presentation, we're talking about the internet exchange or the data center, 
the huts to the cabinets, right? It's almost That's like correct. a web. Is that roughly correct? That's correct. Yep. So think about your 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 exchange or your your head end or your data center as the center of the universe, right? The, yep. the, 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 the nerve center of the entire network. And then one tier down from that, Dave, if you want to pull up that diagram, that'd be, oh, beautiful. <laughs> Great timing. Yeah. So, so this is really your data center, right? This, uh, uh, well, it's actually upstream from this. So mm -hmm. the fiber hut really is connected to the backbone, right? So this is your fiber hut here. Your data center would be back here, right? That, that would be your central point where, where multiple fiber huts are connected. Are, is and there any power in the fire, fiber cabinet or power is only required in the hut? It's only required in the hut. So the cabinets are all passive. Yep. And no, no, nothing energized. Nothing with a plug is in those cabinets. Gotcha. Yep. So your, your, your fiber huts will have multiple cabinets coming off of it. Just like you have multiple transformers coming off of a, you know, off of a, a substation. And uh, each one of those cabinets then will feed homes and businesses along those routes, either aerial or underground. So as we look at uh, the placement of these huts uh, and the cabinets, you know, we want to we want to place them strategically. But what we can also do is if we find one location that's not as optimal is better for the community, then we extend our feeders right in, into that hut. We move, we extend our feeders further into that hut. Uh, wherever that's located in the city. So it increases our feeder lengths a little bit, right? And our costs a little bit, but for the sake of the community, if that is a much more palatable option, you know, it's not, um, it's not breaking the bank on the network. You know, they're small increments and increases uh, feeder cost versus potentially the community impact that it has. So we always, we always, that we, that's why we start this conversation early because it's good to really identify, you know, where the least path of resistance is for fiber huts or through utilizing existing facilities. And then we can design the network around that. Understood. Fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Vice Chair Siegel. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm still trying to understand it. it when I look at this plan, it almost seems like we've bent over backwards to have the huts sort of outside of any sort of community area, which I understand if we're sensitive, we're concerned about community members being sensitive. But I mean, like I look at the animal shelters on the other side of Highway 101, we're worried about sea level rise. It seems so far away, we're adding costs. And I'm just wondering whether we looked at things like uh, parks, the community center, areas that are much more central to the community where maybe we can control costs and maybe there is an area that we can um, set aside and, and try to make it look nice. So we do have a parks ordinance. We did reach out to CSD and the city is very dear to the park. So in order to undedicate any parkland, it would require a residence vote. So we have to put it out to, on a ballot and the uh, residents will have to decide. So that would take some time as well. Okay, so that's Parkland. And what about like the community center or library? Is it the same situation with, or a school, you know, for that matter? Or is it the same with any of those? Right, if it's inside a city facility, that's something we're also exploring. But for schools, we would have to probably negotiate some sort of deal with them, I'm sure, and find the suitable space. But that is something we are definitely exploring is inside of facilities of existing buildings. So. It won't be an eyesore and there won't be as much public scrutiny, I guess. And the infrastructure is already there. So, yeah, so I guess I'd like to understand or maybe it's next time to understand what those trade offs are and what we're talking. You said you, you said it'd be a little more expense. I'd like to understand how much a little more expense is because we're talking about the other side of Highway 101 up in the foothills. I'm not seeing a lot of um, maybe the one at Seal or a, um, Colorado Station is a little more communal community centered, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Dean's even asked us to reach out to the real estate manager to see if there's any properties for sale. And there's really nothing for this size available. Anything available right now probably be in the million dollar range for a vacant building for sale. Well, also, so. if I could just add, Vice Chair, um, you know, one of the, the thing with these huts, 
we were looking actually for three different locations, one on the south side, one in the middle, and then also one on the north side. So that way there, when you build your networking portion of it, you're actually breaking it in sections so that when you build out to an area, you're not overloading, as John said, and not having too many huts all in one area or you know making one giant hut that you would want to then disperse. It doesn't make sense that way. So as you build it, so we did look at um, a couple locations um, on the south side, um, which is down by Fire Station 5. It's kind of the far um, south side. And then Hail Whale is something that the utilities owns, as you saw in that foot in that fenced off area, that we could probably maybe be able to build something back there, something that we're also anticipating. And then Colorado is in the center, more or less, and it's on the other side of 101. So we, you know, we're looking at those considerations. I guess I have one more follow up. Sorry, but if there is a hut, so most of these huts, uh, one or two sides of them doesn't really have a lot of customers. Uh, if you if you look out from one or two sides of them, whether you're talking about Animal Center or Colorado Substation or even Hale, right? You're along the water, or the road, or the highway, or something. Does it matter from a from a build out in the future, is it better to have it where you have potential customers surrounding it 360? Does that matter? Um, does it shorten the the amount of, um, I don't know, wiring or whatever it is that has to be built? Well, I think as John and, and Dave talked about is that, you know, I think the thing is that we would have to put in more huts or I'm sorry, more um, cabinets these cabinets throughout the um, neighborhoods, which I think that those are gonna be more of an eyesore um, as we get deeper into the um, neighborhoods, which you know, is something that we really don't wanna have, maybe on the outskirts or if there's areas, but you know, nope. As I can look at it as wanting customers to uh, wanna build underground uh, for their overhead, you know, trying to find places for those transformers is really difficult. And so I'm thinking that even though that these are smaller than the transformer, they're still going to be a problem. Nobody's gonna want that in front of their home. So <clears throat> if we don't have as many huts, then we're gonna have to put more of these cabinets throughout the city, which I just don't think that that's really gonna be something. Right now, you know, every, when you look at a traffic signal, we have traffic signal um, boxes, mostly at all the traffic signals. And that's about the size of the boxes that we're looking at. Um, but, you know, there are downtown areas, wherever the traffic lights are, they're at the corners, things like that, that we've been able to find. Um, but I think though, that if you get deeper into it, you're gonna find that some of these cabinets are gonna have to be inside the neighborhoods. So I think that's a, that was the trade-off. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. No, no, you're exactly right, uh, Dean, uh, uh, Director Bachelor. We, we look at, you know, the, the, ca the cabinets hold about up to about 500 customers, typically. So think about that as a neighborhood, a neighborhood area, a neighborhood cabinet. Some are smaller, some will be 250, but generally that's the range of size of the number of customers served by those cabinets. So, you know, if we increase the number of huts, we can use a fewer cabinets and we can also reduce the size of the cabinets generally, because we can bring more of the, the feeders out into the neighborhoods versus having so much distribution. And that, that actually is good for the network because it keeps our costs down. But as he mentioned, it's a, it's a trade-off. So we'll work through those trade-offs with you all as, as we get further along to try to really dimension it the best way to keep the costs down, but also to keep the, the sight lines in the community minimally impacted because we we deal with it in every project we in, in Hillsborough we're just you know we went through sort of a four-month planning process to to relocate four huts that were originally designed in a certain area and the city you know community just uh we went through a charrette process with them and they they decided yep these are the locations we want them and this is how we're going to do it so uh so it's just a it's a process it'll take some work yeah, I'm a little more worried about the hut, uh, the, sorry, the cabinets. I think the huts, we can find places, but, you know, we sort of been to that rodeo before with transformer boxes. And so um, I don't want, I, you know, it'd be good to start thinking about that early, I guess, yeah. we well, have experience, but. Chair Siegel, I, or Vice Chair Siegel, I think also we, we can, 
you know, we can get pretty customized with the network. And if we, even if we have communications closets, if we have more property that we can use other city facilities, you know, more smaller spaces can, can be good in this respect to, to limit the amount of those cabinets that are out there. So we'll take a deeper dive on that as we get into this phase of the project, because our, our staff will actually be out there you know, visiting sites and, and working with your team to find the best locations. Uh, let's see, Commissioner Bowie. Yes. Uh, so my my question with these the huts versus the cabinets, um, there's been significant uh, allocations of state money, I think, over the summer um, for middle and last mile. Is there a distinction within this infrastructure that puts us in that realm um, of that those new uh, pots of money that are coming available and um, whether that's being considered? It has. We're actually, uh, Commissioner Bowie, we're working on a, a really a grant portfolio for you now to show you what's out there and available. Um, Palo Alto is, is uh, there are programs at the state level that are bringing new infrastructure into cities. One of Palo Alto's challenges is that the demographics are strong and that doesn't necessarily lend the best when you're going after grant funds. Uh, you're pretty well served from a telecommunications project. You know, most of the grants are designed for rural and underserved and low and moderate income areas. But there are programs that are coming out both at the state and federal level that we're analyzing for you to determine at least if there's a part, you know, some funding that could be utilized in, in the build out. So we should have that in the next few weeks uh, in presenting to the project team. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Johnston. Well, I share the concerns that others have uh, mentioned about these uh, the cabinets and what the community reaction is going to be uh, to cabinets spread throughout the uh, neighborhoods. So, and I ex expect that there's going to be a strong preference uh, if if we give people a preference uh, a choice to have underground cabinets. What's the cost difference between the underground cabinet and a above ground? And uh, it's not significant in the overall scope of the project. So really, the, the most the, the most significant is the fiber and the construction, the materials for the cabinets and the underground enclosures. Uh, you know, maybe a twenty percent delta from a from a, a pad mounted cabinet or a above ground cabinet. The the one challenge is the size, right? We have to scale down because we can't get as many customers into that. It's just too too big of a space, we, you know, to, to mount underground. So uh, we, we would need to um, find locations. You know, the goal would be if, if there are some locations that could have an above ground cabinet, great. Uh, but for, the, for others that need those underground ones, dimension the network so that we can use those as much as possible. So you mentioned in the slide reusing existing cabinets. What what's an example of an existing cabinet? Oh well, uh, exist, just existing facilities. If there's existing any any of the city's existing facilities that are out there, we can potentially use that as a um, as either a hut or even as a cabinet location. So instead of having that you know, cabinet mounted in, in a neighborhood or, or let's say that hut mounted in our neighborhood, we can move that inside of an existing facility if there's available space and the environment is is supportive of, you know, power, cooling, uh, security, you know, the things that you need to basically run a, a, a broadband uh, facility. I take it you're not talking about co-locating these cabinet, these fiber cabinets with kind of other cabinets for traffic signals and whatnot that are scattered around. You know, it's, 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 a, it sounds like a great idea, but it's a, ch it's a real challenge when it comes to security. I mean, especially with traffic and, and transportation and, and even electric, right? It just, uh, the, the operational challenges become a little bit more. We did talk to that operational team and there are some potential cabinets that are out there, some coax power supply that are, have been yep. abandoned. So there's 27 of those. So we would retrofit those or reuse those cabinets as one to reduce the new ones. Okay. So there are a few opportunities. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Metz. Yes, uh, Chair Forcell, I had some broader questions.
questions. Uh, I don't know if this is the correct time. If we if we're still talking about the infrastructure, would you want to wait, or I I can address them now? Uh, I mean, do they pertain to the this the topic that, as listed on the agenda? Yeah, it's to the uh, broad uh, fiber broadband expansion, but not yeah. the physical Before infrastructure. It. I mean, I I there's nobody else with their hand up, so I think this is a fine time. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah. Folks, thank you very much for the presentation, also for the immense amount of work that went into this. That's that's very evident. And also the idea of piggybacking on the city network needs, I think is really a great idea. Um, I had three questions, one technical question and two kind of business plan questions. Uh, the technical question is, you know, I inferred from reading the documents that the service we're providing to residences would be one gigabit internet, something like that. And if that's the case, do we really need fiber to the home? I can see the need for fiber in the network, but do we really need fiber to the home? It seems like there are, you know, that drives most of the cost of this implementation. And, you know, I wonder if we really need, from a technical standpoint, if we really need that, uh, you know, kind of approach. Um, I, I don't know if you want to talk about that now or we, we can address that now and then we can talk about the other questions. Sure, would you like me to field that, uh, Commissioner? Sure. That's, okay, um, so sh sure. So, I mean, at a fundamental level, fi I mean, fiber really is the, the only technology that can truly provide one gigabit symmetrical. So, you know, there are other technologies out there that provide um, uh, up to gigabit, but the difference it is twofold. One, those technologies are very oversubscribed, very shared, meaning that there may be one gigabit available, but the actual speeds that everyone are, is receiving in that area, let's say connected to that cabinet, may be much lower because they're all at it's all it's five o'clock and everybody's home from work and is on the internet. So, you know, the difference with fiber is in, in this specific type of uh, infrastructure is that, you know, everyone has their dedicated connectivity. The second difference is it's symmetrical versus asymmetrical. So even those other technologies may be able to provide higher speeds or high, or let's say high speeds close to fiber, the uploads are still, you know, five, 10 to 20, 20 meg, right? You can't get gigabit uploads or, or even 100 megabit uploads with the other technologies that are out there today. So that, that's really the first um, aspect of this is the difference between sort of the shared and the copper technologies versus fiber. Okay, thank you. Um, the, one, of, one of the two business plan questions I had relates to the market. Um, I was you know kind of concerned in reading the document that the, there was an assumed take rate, which I thought was pretty high, 30 to 50 percent, depending, you know, depending the details of which area you're talking about for residential. Um, but it sounds like from the discussion tonight that we're really just starting the, the market research. Uh, that, that's what I understood you'd be saying before. So I guess my concern is, and I guess the market research will tell the tale, that you know, based on my experience, you know, a 30% plus market share for a new, a small new entrant against two plus large competitors, you know, selling essentially an undifferentiated service against two well entrenched competitors um, and very well financed companies in their core business, you know, getting a third of the market sounds pretty challenging. Is, I mean, do you have experience that, you know, that's doable? Uh, yeah, if, if you look at most of the most of the municipal utilities that provide service today, their average take rate is around 40 percent uh, when, when they're in a market dominated by the a duopoly. Right. Meaning that the existing cable provider and the existing uh, telephone company. So a good example of that is like Longmont, Colorado, Longmont's um, competing against Comcast and CenturyLink in their market. They're a little bit larger than Palo Alto. They're uh, 36,000 homes, give or take. Um, they have 57% market share and they've been operating for six years. Um, 
Chattanooga is very similar. They have about 53%, 54%, maybe higher. Uh, their market is a little bit larger. They're at uh, 180,000 population. Um, so a lot of the municipal providers out there today are sort of in that 40% sweet spot, seem to grow over time beyond that. And those are all sort of in the suburban tier two, tier three cities, uh, it, similar in size and, and scale to Palo Alto. Okay, and thank you. And what you just raised, you know, what actually was my biggest concern, which is retaliation by uh, the incumbent competitors. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a statement in one of the documents that they may temporarily uh, lower their prices, but it, it just seems like, you know, basic business strategy that, you know, we're attacking core business of very large companies. And it seems like, they're going to retaliate in every way they can, you know, possibly, I don't know, threatening Sue or, uh, you know, using their market power, uh, for example, offering a premium service at a lower price or bundling services that we don't offer like cable TV, maybe eventually lowering price. But it, it just seems like, uh, you know, I, I welcome your experience and what you're seeing in other cities. It just seems like these folks you know, really, you would expect to fight to the death to defend this market. Yeah, you know, it's it, there, and there's a couple of different dynamics that are going on there, Commissioner Metz. One is on uh, one is pricing, right? Pr price competition against an entrant like Palo Alto or or any municipal utility that's entering the market. Two is really the product differentiation, right? When we look at well, what what does the existing provider have versus Palo Alto? How how is that different? Because the products are a bit different, right? In terms of the the aspects of fiber that I talked about earlier, that's really what the municipal utilities use as a competitive advantage against the, the existing providers, right? F higher speeds, symmetrical service, and higher reliability. Those are sort of the three features of fiber that are really dominate the, 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 uh, the or, or, or in the consumer's mind is, is, are the important aspects in their choices of internet providers. When we look at the pricing, I think one thing that's interesting is you would, you would tend to think that pricing, the, you know, the big providers would just drop their prices. But you know, what it does is it has a, a knock-on effect in communities the neighboring communities. So for example, we saw some price decreases, uh, maybe five to 10% in, uh, in Longmont when Longmont, Colorado launched uh, from the incumbent. Uh, but you know, we didn't see significant decreases. And really why that was is because you know, they control an, a much larger market in the front range of Colorado, right? Between Fort Collins and Loveland and, and Longmont, there's you know, 350,000 uh, re re uh, residents, right? And that's a large subscriber pool. So we see that in those markets, you know, where a large provider, you know, could drop their price. Regionally, they have to be very careful, right? Not to erode prices at the, at the larger level. So they'll make a calculation and how important it is to maintain their market share in Palo Alto versus let's say the general Bay Area. Because if they start eroding their prices in Palo Alto to compete with Palo Alto, but they don't have that type of competition in other areas of the Bay, in other parts of the Bay Area, it starts to give them more erosion across those other markets, right? Meaning that, oh, my prices are now lower in Palo Alto. Well, why am, why am, why am I a Comcast customer in Mountain View paying a higher price than I'm paying in Palo Alto? So you start to see that erosion. They wanna keep that price as high as possible. And we've seen small decreases in price, but we haven't seen significant. Uh, significant price competition. Okay. I'm kind of surprised because I mean, you know, if you're in Menlo Park or Mountain View, you know, you can't really move easily um, and it's easy for them to change the price. But anyway, you, uh, I think you would, you would address what I was concerned about because I didn't see these issues addressed in the documents that we received. Um, so I, I would hope that this would be addressed in uh, detail going forward. It sounds like you're just getting into this quantitatively. Um, yeah, and, and in two parts, Commissioner Metz. One is really the market research, and two is the, the sort of the business planning. So those two go hand in hand to really determine, 
what the business risks are, how do we mitigate those risks, uh, you know, as, as Palo Alto, and what should we expect as, you know, in the competitive environment, right? Because the, you're right, they're, you know, deep pockets, and they, the, the providers are intent at, uh, at stopping, you know, municipal projects where they see it feasible. Right. And I, I, I'm actually kind of surprised. I mean, it's, I think it's really important what you described, some of the empirical outcomes that you've seen. I think that's, that's really critical to knowing, you know, what's going to happen rather than, you know, what people say they will do, you know, in terms of take rate and such. Yeah, absolutely. And, but I'm, I'm a little surprised because, you know, it seems like uh, you, if, if I were them, you really want to put out the fire, right? You wouldn't want one municipality to be doing this because everybody else would look at it and say, wow, they're doing it. Why don't, why don't we do it as, as well? Yeah. So it seemed like that would be viewed as quite a threat. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that in terms of us being able to do this viably. So anyway, thank you very much for uh, addressing that. Mr. Sure. Sure. Okay. Great, well, thank you. I don't see any other hands up. I don't have any additional comments myself. Um, great presentation, good discussion. Thank you everybody for coming and sharing all this material with us. Um, so I think we can go ahead and move on. We are running a fair bit behind uh, schedule. Um, and I will say, uh, which I forgot to do when we came back from closed session, that we had no reportable action from our closed session. Um, so just to get that out there, just an hour and change late. Um, are there any commissioner comments or reports from meetings and events? All right, um, then we can move to our final action item, uh, suggestion sure, of future topics. Sure, of course, oh. sure, of course, so. I'm sorry, I did have a uh, oh. copy of that one. Uh, Go ahead, Commissioner Metz. Yes, just get, I have my notes here or something. Yes, I had uh, two meetings. Uh, this is following up our last meeting uh, in September. Uh, at the very tail end of the meetings, we talked about uh, emergency preparedness and response. And I said I would take the action to uh, follow up on that before we discussed it at a commission meeting. Um, I had a meeting uh, about a week ago with Ken Duker, head of OES, to explore this idea and get his feedback. He was very positive and you know, contributed some suggestions to my own ideas about you know, how to go about this. Uh, and then I guess yesterday I had a meeting uh, with uh, Director Batchelor and a, a bunch of the folks on his team uh, to follow this up. I, I won't go into the details, but the basic uh, action coming out of that is we're going to agree, I, uh, Lena Perkins is point person for um, utilities, and I'll be point for now for UAC. Uh, and we're going to get together. She's going to provide some research that the uh, uh, utilities department has done over the summer with, as I understood, like Stanford uh, postdoc or, or intern. Um, but it sounded like some very pertinent research addressing resilience and uh, emergency response. So she's going to share that. Uh, and then we're going to get together and talk about, well, what are the specific emergencies we want to be prepared for? What would be a technical solution? And if we can nail that down, then we can get into broader discussions of all the complicated issues about how to address those. Like, you know, uh, deal, dealing with who pays for it, how does the utility find time if they're involved, you know, and so on. So I think the next step after she and I work together would be getting uh, the utilities department together with OES, with uh, um, with Ken Duker and probably Nathan uh, to you know talk to get their input. So that's the only thing. That's the only thing I want to report. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, returning then to uh, suggested future topics for upcoming meetings. Um, 
just looking at the rolling calendar, there are still a number of items that have yet to be scheduled. Um, so I don't think it's a problem if we don't have anything to add to the list this evening. Oh, uh, Commissioner Smith. Hi, um, sorry, I didn't realize that we weren't gonna go through the utilities quarterly financial update. I, I didn't realize that, that was just an attachment and just um, an information memorandum. I did actually have a question about it. Are we allowed to talk about an item that's not agendized, but is a information memorandum? Mm, we can't update? discuss it, but you can certainly suggest it as a future topic of discussion in a future meeting. Okay, so the question for the future meeting what then would be, on these quarterly updates, is it possible we can get um, a snapshot or an update with respect to our sale of RECs? And if there has been any discussion within city council or within the utilities department about ending our um, current sale of bucket one RECs? Look, Commissioner Smith, if you look at the um, schedule portion of it that we talked about that we would lump uh, EV charger installs, bucket one racks, fiber updates, but more around uh, bucket one and EV charger updates. We were gonna do those on a quarterly basis. That's what the goal was. Right, okay, so if, if, we, if we do it on a quarterly basis, should it be in this? So, so what we decided to do was we were going to take and have a quarterly basis just of the financials. We're not gonna, we weren't gonna mix and match oh. and pull them all together. Okay. So the, so the next um, update is going to be about charger installations and then about bucket rec sales. And so there will be another report that will be coming. Um, is it, is it safe to, would it be accurate to describe it as that we'll be updated on EV charging and bucket one rec sales quarterly, but we will get more than four reports a year because there's like the general utility update quarterly, but then there's also these other updates that don't hit at the same month. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so that's, that's just a little confusing. We might find, we might, we might want to find a, a different name for the program updates that are not part of the quarterly report. Well, I think uh, also, and, and, and chair, I agree with you hundred percent, but I think also, um, you know, and I, I raised this a couple of months ago is, is our, our are we still under the, the view that the sale of bucket one Rex is a temporary uh, stopgap to budget crisis? So I think you're asking for it to be a discussion item, not just, I a, think not I just am, an informational. But, but, I, but I don't want to be pushy. No, that's fine. Um, we can, I'm going to uh, be pushy, but I don't want to be pushy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so... Let uh, let me talk to staff about it and okay. see what we can do. If we can have um, a quick conversation next month on this. Okay. Um, I got to find out too, is that, I, I apologize. I don't know when the quarterly was going to come back out again for EV chargers and stuff. So let me, yeah. let me talk. Oh, Jonathan. Jonathan. So I, I, can, I can speak to that really briefly here. So the, um, the, it, so we actually had an update at the September, it, there was an informational report sent to the September UAC that had an update on the EV chargers and the um, and the uh, uh, the rec exchange program. The next um, item is it's likely to come in dis, in December at this point. The next quarterly, I think. Although we're trying to move them up a little bit, uh, you know, so they're closer to the quarter end. Um, so, so you will have that update and then maybe Dean and I can talk offline about, uh, you know, responding to the question that you raised there. So, sorry, Jonathan, you say the September and I apologize. I was absent on the September. Did the September meetings uh, informational memorandum, did it include what the proceeds were for bucket one Rex for it the period should, in August? I would have Don't to double check it, but it that. should it should have included that. We, we did set it up with that section. So I'll double check it and I'll send oh, you a reference. Okay. okay. And, uh, and, and maybe uh, we can also res respond to your question by email as well would be another option. If you'd okay. like to have a more in-depth or would you like to have a more in-depth discussion? I, I think the entire com the UAC should probably be consulted. We, we, 
we discussed at length whether or not we should be doing it. So I think it is probably something that is agendized. What my suggestion would be when the next report comes out, let's let's agendize a short discussion on the topic. So that that probably will be uh, November, December time frame then. Okay. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. And I will do a quick scan for hands again. All right. I think that brings us to the end of our meeting. Um, I'll move to adjourn. Thank you, Vice Chair Siegel. Do we have a second? second. I'll second. All right. And we don't usually do a roll call. We usually all wave or give a thumbs up to show that we're good to adjourn. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, staff. Thank you, commissioners, for staying late. Appreciate it. Thank good you, everyone. Today. Thank you, Chair. See you next time. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.